Welcome to The Lover's Hole, where we're reading and rereading the Aubrey Matron books of Patrick O'Brien. You're with Mike. And Ian. As we're back on the slow read through Master and Commander. Ian, can you catch us up a little bit on where we were last time and what we might be seeing this time? With pleasure, Mike. Last time, Stephen had been worried about how Jack and Dylan, these two very ambitious, very um, honorable naval officers, might in their different ways strike out their permanent character and what that might mean for their friendship. Jack had kind of blotted that particular copybook pretty quickly, embarrassing himself at the party uh, at Molly Hart's. Um, the Sophie then had left Mahon in a little bit of disgrace um, without full water. The hands had been whipped for their drunkenness, the drunkenness being of an unknown source. Stephen had worked to save Cheslin, a former sin eater, from Sailor's Prejudice. And during the episode, we learned a lot more about the United Irishman from our guest, Paddy Cullivan. This time, Mike, the cruise continues. The gunnery gets a little better. There's some action ahead and a changing, really, really rapidly changing relationship between Jack and James Dillon. There's a problem with Stephen's ASP, that's A-S-P, and fireworks both real and relational. And we haven't seen the end of those United Irishmen yet, but where is Stephen in all of this? Oh, it sounds like a really interesting chapter. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, we ended the last chapter with a cry of land ho, as we so often do. It's either, a, a, you know, a land or a sail. And and this happens to be Cape Now, Cape Ship in English. You know, the <laughs> end of the Sophie's Southern cruising ground here. So Jack compliments Marshall, the master, on an excellent landfall. And a number of the hands sort of standing around and up in the rigging notice the way the master reacts. He's kind of unable to speak, clasping his hands, jerking his head. And O'Brien tells us that even though the hands notice this, Jack does not. He, as always, just thinks, you know, Marshall has this incredible zeal. He's an excellent officer and just is really great at his job. So this little interaction between Jack and Marshall that Dylan's commented on to Stephen before continues here. Jack is ready to practice the great guns, and he wants to do so in the darkness. Dylan's a little concerned about that. And Jack's saying, no, no, well, what we'll do is we'll go from daylight into darkness. And this is going to be the crew's first nighttime practice here. Now, Stephen usually disappears for gunnery practice. He has no interest in the noise, in the smell, in the chance of injury, terrible injury to crew members, or as only you know, Stephen can think, a sky emptied of birds. So I'm not going to say any birds in the midst of this. Why be on deck here? But he happens to come on deck just as they're about to begin. And Jack is delighted to see him. He assumes that Stephen's come up to witness the crew's progress in gunnery. And, and you know, he assumes, as Jack often does, that everybody loves this as much as Jack does. And he says to Stephen, Lord, you should have seen the Nile and heard it. How happy you would have been. <laughs> and, we you know, Stephen would have been anything but happy. huh? Yeah, I mean, we've got two little bits of Jack Aubrey tone deafness there. He's he's tone deaf to the idea that uh, Marshall's infatuated with him. And he's tone deaf to the idea that Stephen might not share Jack's enthusiasm for the sound of the noise of gunnery. Anyhow, I mean, to be fair to Stephen, who's who's come on a little in his naval character, he can tell how much the crew has improved. And as he's watching, we, we learn that there's a prize for any gun that hits the target that's being towed out there, and an even greater prize for the watch that fires fastest without, as the rules for the competition say, any wild, disqualifying shots. And we get this great little moment of competition, friendly rivalry between larboard and starboard watches. The larboard watch hits the targets, gets in three rounds of rolling broadsides in six minutes, 10 seconds. The starboard watch misses the target, but completes three rounds in five minutes and 57. And they are quietly being roasted by the larboard watch. Unscrupulous grass combing buggers, they say, that blazed away, blind and reckless, anything to win, powder at 18 pence the pound. And you can almost hear the, the tutting and the eyes rolling. Um, and as darkness has fallen, as Jack predicted, the crew are still 
solid in this exercise, they compete again with lit targets. And Jack's really pleased that the darkness isn't making any difference to their firing, and it looks like their competency with the gunnery is really coming along here. So this is all, I think, pretty high spirits for Jack Aubrey. The ship is in good shape. The men are shooting well in dusk and in nighttime conditions. And he's clearly inclined to head, head below and round off a successful day with some music. He asks Stephen to join him and also asks Dylan. And poor old Dylan has, has to beg off. He says, you know what a sad waste music is on me, like pearls before swine. And Jack, when they're below, tells Stephen that he's actually really pleased with the gunnery improvement. He can now run the Sophie close inshore, he says, with a clear conscience, without risking the poor sloop too much. And he's continuing this journey that, you know, he started out with the, the shenanigans with the main yard and the 12 powders. He's really trying to uh, you know, refine the capabilities, the fighting capabilities of Sophie and put her in her best form. And Stephen's reply is great. I am happy that you're pleased. And certainly the mariners seem to ply their pieces with a wonderful dexterity. And now here, Stephen flips him off completely. But you must allow me to insist that that note is not an A. Ain't it? cried Jack anxiously. Is this better? And Stephen nods, taps his foot three times. And away they go into Mr. Brown's Minorcan Divertimento. Right. This is a really fascinating little musical moment here. Um, musicians around the world, uh, certainly in, in the Western tradition, and um, certainly with stringed instruments, we all tune to A. And in the 21st century, everybody more or less agrees that we all tune to an A of a known frequency, which is 440 hertz. And most musicians can probably hear in their in their sort of mind's ear what A440 roughly sounds like. If they've got perfect pitch, then they will claim that they can hear it perfectly. What's interesting here is that A back in the late 18th century might have been quite a bit lower. Might have been quite a bit lower just because different musical traditions thought they knew A to be different. Quite a bit lower as well because the stringed instruments weren't as strong, string tensions weren't as high. So, and these days, people who play what you might call period instrumentation or baroque instrumentation, 18th century and earlier, will very often play at a lower pitch than A440. And it's a little bit of a showing off moment for a musician, for a musician to go, oh, yeah, that's that's an A. Uh, and actually, n nobody can really land it, you know, with, within you know half a semitone unless you're really really good or you're really really lucky so this is Stephen showing off that he thinks he knows what an a is anyhow jack presumably tweaks it up a little bit Stephen's happy and off they go after the after the minorcan divertimento by the you know composed by this guy mr brown they're back together and they're talking again about gunnery and jack tells Stephen how vitally important excellent gunnery is Anything can happen, he says, in five minutes' time at sea. Ha-ha, <laughs> you should hear Lord Nelson. In this case of gunnery, a single broadside can bring down a mast and so win a fight. There's no telling from one hour to the next when we may have to fire it. There is no telling at sea. So, Mike, Stephen's showing off his musical chops. Jack is showing off just what a high fighting pitch he's brought the Sophie to. Uh, and we should point out that we're really grateful as well to a couple of our shipmates on the Facebook Aubrey Matron Appreciation Society who have already raised and debated a little bit this point about the, the, the period A. So hello if you're listening to Doug Ward, Julie Hoffman, and Mick Mickelson. We just heard this too about Jack saying, you know, with Nelson's comment about there's no telling when you're going to have to fire, you know, have that great gunnery at sea. And O'Brien really underscores this for us. He underscores Jack and Lord Nelson's statements, pointing out that at that moment, if you had a darkness piercing, all seeing eye, that eye would have seen that there's a Spanish frigate, the Cacafuego, passing silently a mile and a half away. But had the Sophie not spent 15 minutes kind of, you know, dealing with her lighted target cast earlier, they would have intercepted each other directly. And it would have also seen that there's a merchant convoy that the Sophie is now going to be essentially right next to at dawn. 
it, it, it's really striking visual. You know, O'Brien's inviting us into his imagination of you know, his view of the chart and teasing us a little bit with this convoy that the Sophie's going to encounter at dawn and the Cacafuego, which hmm, who knows if and when and how we'll bump into her. Yeah, I can I can almost see, like you say, in, in in the movie, you know, kind of pulling back from the Sophie's lights into the darkness and then like yeah. looking close by and seeing uh, along with the, the proper, you know, ominous music, this cacafuego and yeah, yeah. then this this convoy going, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And what does happen is we get Babington, you know, next trying to wake Jack up. Babington's trying to get his attention and Jack is murmuring, hush, sweetheart, hush, sweetheart, in a dream here. But when Babington reports that Dylan is saying top lights in the offering, Jack, you know, snaps, boy, immediately awake. And we, we you know, we hear this so often through the canon who Jack can just fall asleep anywhere in doing anything, but can come awake immediately and there are five ships a little further from shore than the Sophie, which is lying hove to under a dark cliff. So the Sophie probably haven't spotted her yet. She's under this dark cliff. And then these five ships that are kind of sailing in convoy very close to shore to stay away from any predators out there in the ocean here. The Gloire, a fast French privateer with 12 eight pounders, is escorting two settees, which have about six guns apiece a tartan, and the Santa Lucia, a Neapolitan snow, which was the Gloire's prize, uh, a ship filled with French royalists that that the Gloire had taken. And and that one actually is the closest to the Sophie at the moment here. Yeah, and they've fallen in lucky, really, I guess, because just as they've uh, as the sun has risen here, they've encountered themselves in this really favorable position. If they can play their cards right, and if their maneuvers and their gunnery are on point, then they stand the chance of snapping up some action here. Uh, Mike, th- th- this vessel, the Gloire, we've got a couple of references to that in real life, I think. We do, we do. It's an actual 1799 French privateer. And yeah. interestingly, we'll hear a little bit later about uh, the captain of the Gloire, you know, firing muskets at officers. And, uh, you know, when you th- read the official account of HMS Albatross, who captured the, you know, the real, one of the real glories, there were several, in March of 1801, you know, you wouldn't think that it's very far off of perhaps the, you know, this here. And we have, you know, to nobody's surprise whatsoever, another Gloire featured in a cutting out mission commanded by Lord Cochrane in 1806. Mm-hmm. It's like the, the French kind of put together all these nice saucy little ships called Gloire for all of these heroes <laughs> to, go, right. to, go and, right. to go and have a pop at. Well done. Thank you, the French Navy. Now, Jack's mind starts moving quickly. This is a perfect situation for Jack. There's a, a bit of tactical planning to do. There's probably the opportunity for a bit of sleight of hand and the chance for him to practice the gunnery that he's been um, building up with the crew here. He's figuring out his strategy when Lieutenant Dillon interrupts to ask if he, Dillon, can make a suggestion. And uh, Mike, I was really excited here to think that perhaps these two are going to come together and put their military minds together. Right. And to, to my mind, at least, Jack steps on this a little bit. He says, um, I'm okay, but I don't want a council of war. He kind of puts out this really strong signal that says, uh, I, I'm not really looking for your input. Councils of war never decide anything. And Dylan rather affronted takes the hint and merely suggests that they beat to quarters. And Jack, maybe conciliating a little bit, decides to share his strategy. He's shifting position so that the Santa Lucia hides the Sophie from the other ships. And Dylan is going to lead a boarding crew in two boats to take the Santa Lucia. And then meanwhile, Jack will bring the Sophie up from behind when the Gloire wears to help the Santa Lucia. And he'll be there to fire at one of the settees and then also rake the gloire as she goes round. So Jack's got this great tactical plan. Um, we remember, of course, that there is this Danish brig in this particular part of the Mediterranean that looks a lot like the Sophie. So they take their chance to make the ship look as best they can like a merchant brig while the boarders slip away in boats on the landward side, on the concealed side. And Jack has um, Ricketts and Babington, the two midshipmen, ready to lead their top men up to set sail. Um, the prize crew aboard the Santa Lucia, these royalists, believe that the Sophie is the, indeed that Danish brig that they've often seen. 
and they believe that until they catch sight of these two boats full of men headed for them. Dylan's crew quickly overwhelms the seven men who surrender. They break out the Santa Lucia sails, and Sophie does the same, and now the action is on. The gloire starts to wear, starts to turn around with the wind behind her, and there's frantic activity on all of the convoy ships. And I love this moment of you know, Jack, with full sail on the Sophie, comes steaming in, sails past Dylan, the colors flying, gives Dylan and his crew a cheer, and shouts, well done indeed, sir, with his hat in the air as they sail past. I'm like, here, I'm thinking, oh, this is great. You know, Jack and Dylan, maybe they're going to see eye to eye and they're going to have a successful action together and it's all going to be okay. Yeah, I, I'm feeling exactly the same way. Ian. It's like Jack really seems to like Dylan and goes out of his yeah. way, you know, even though he stepped on him on the quarter deck that, you know, because he's used to having his privacy there, he goes out of his way to get her, give him that big attaboy there. Good, good on you, Jack. Well, the Sophie now is a quarter mile away, bearing down fast on this French privateer. And as as the Sophie's bearing down on her, the privateer's captain, kind of aware of what Jack's planning, changes her sails to stop her stern coming around. She doesn't want the Sophie's raking fire. Jack thinks the maneuver is just a little too late. And he's as he's going towards her, he sends a shot across the settee's bows, or attempts to, and actually it goes through her foresail, but she signals a surrender. Jack continues towards the Gloa and fires when she comes in range, and the first shot gets off just like he wants, but the wind changes suddenly, and we'd had a little bit of a forewarning of this as, you know, they're, they're by the cliffs yeah. there, they're so close into shore, the wind's likely to do as, as the sun's coming up strange things, and it starts pushing the Sophie's head around and the Gloire's stern around. The Sophie tries to correct and fires again, but she's lost much of her way now, and the Gloire is gathering speed. Uh, so they start sailing along parallel courses with the Sophie some way behind her. They're sailing fast. They're firing back and forth at one another, and the convoy is vanishing behind them, you know, into the distance here. Yeah. So... Uh, you know, and there's this interesting thing. We remember in one of their first actions, Ricketts, the midshipman, and especially Jack's new clerk standing on the quarterdeck. The clerk back then, you know, kind of had his eyeballs bulging out. But now O'Brien's telling us that Jack and Ricketts and the clerk are standing right there on the quarterdeck as the balls are coming whipping right past them. And these are you know, I get these moments in, in, in action like this when I'm kind of amazed uh, how, you know, it, it, it just doesn't track with my, uh, I, I guess, my 2022 sensibilities. <laughs> I'm used to standing there with these musket shots and cannonballs flying past you, just standing straight and rigid here. Um, fortunately, the Frenchman's cannon fire is high and wild, but they continue to pull further away from the Sophie. And, and you know, Jack doesn't want that. Um, while she's pulling away, Jack turns to cross under her stern, you know, to uh, rake her again. But uh, once again, the captain on the glass sees this, puts up his helm. So now Jack sees the glass captain looking at him. And the captain very deliberately takes a musket and aims it right at Jack. And O'Brien writes, the thing was extraordinarily personal. Jack felt an involuntary stiffening of the muscles of his face and chest, a tendency to hold his breath. Now, I would feel something different. I would feel a tendency to dive behind the capstan here. But Jack doesn't move even after the Frenchman fires at him. He stands there, the Frenchman fires. He's ordering the royals to go up so they can catch up with him. And you know, I'm, I'm just kind of, um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of blown away here to see this kind of happening in real time. And Jack just there like a statue. Yeah. And a, a lesser author might have made some big deal out of Jack, you know, su suppressing or not feeling fear. Um, but actually he doesn't. He just describes what Jack does, which is to kind of st stiffen up a little. And we get past it. And it wasn't a big deal. Jack took his chances on the quarter deck. He'll take his chances on many other days on many other quarter decks. Uh, but it probably also goes to show how relatively inaccurate musket fire was in the uh, in the early eighteen hundreds. But there you go. Unfortunately, this one isn't too far off, though, is it? <laughs> no, it's not, because Jack hears the musket ball go by and he turns around, and the helmsman behind him is hit. 
might, again, a, a, a melodramatically inclined author would have put into Jack's mind some kind of great regret. Oh, that ball was meant for me, and it's given this guy this terrible injury. And it, it's not like that at all. It's very, very matter of fact the way this is delivered. Um, the helmsman falls, drags the wheel over, and Jack and Marshall just go right ahead there and grab the wheel. They're not in time. The Sophie's head has flown up into the wind. They're losing their advantage in this little tactical jousting with the Gloire here. They can't fire without slowing down even more, and they're already 200 yards behind and losing ground. Jack is watching her carefully, thinking that she might turn to cross the Sophie's um, stem or go back to protect the convoy, but... We learned that the Gloire seemed more attentive to her safety than her duty. Um, to the merchant who had hired her to protect his ship. So she's the Gloire is sailing away, saying, you know, never mind my duty. Um, the captain is continuing to bang away with this musket at Jack. And uh, one of these musket balls hits a line two feet away from Jack's head. But, says O'Brien, uh, by the time they got to this point, they were almost beyond musket range. And in any case the indefinable frontier between personal animosity and anonymous warfare had passed. It did not affect him. So, having weathered that particular moment, the Sophie herself turns once, yours to fire once more, but the Gloire is continuing to run away, much faster now, even without Royals, um, than the Sophie was with everything up. And after eight broadsides, the Gloire's out of range, and Jack stops firing. I I don't think there's anything in his action that makes us doubt Jack's physical courage, but we're going to have that called into question in the moment here. But for for now, this action chasing the Gloire has kind of terminated, and we're turning back. The Sophie heads towards Cape now. The privateer's gunnery was much worse than the galley that they'd faced a little while ago, so there's actually amazingly little damage. Jack has the hands piped to breakfast. He thinks that the repairs can wait until later. They had it turns out, been remarkably lucky. Um, One dismounted cannon that had not hurt anyone turned over on its neighbour rather than running, as he says, murderously about the deck. And in the increasing heat of the day, Jack's thinking, well, how about the butcher's bill? And he goes down to see the doctor. And Mike, it's it's not terrible down there. Well, at least not for Jack. No, no, not terrible for Jack at all. But something seems to be really upsetting Stephen. You know, as Jack comes down, Stephen says he has a very grave complaint to make about his asp. And I think Jack is like, wait a minute, I'm kind of coming down to find out how many dead and wounded we have here. And Stephen is going on and on about this snake of his, this asp. And Jack says, hold on a minute. Tell me the butcher's bill, and we'll get back to that. And Stephen says, "Oh, there's nobody. You know, there's no dead. You know, really, no serious injuries other than that helmsman's forearm." And Jack's stunned. He can't believe it. They've been in this action. They've you know been chasing each other, firing back and forth the whole time. No dead. No seriously wounded. But Stephen won't give it up about the asp. There's this <laughs> specimen that he brought aboard, and we had heard about this back in you know back in Mahan. And he brought it in this large jar of the best double refined spirits of wine. And somebody broke in, opened the thing up, took all the alcohol and left, as Stephen said, the asp dry, sanded and parched. Now, Jack's a little bit worried. He says, isn't, you know, this is a, you know, obviously a very poisonous snake. You know, isn't the thief going to die from drinking the alcohol contained this poisonous asp? <laughs> and Ian, it, it kind of brings back to mind a little chat with with uh, Patty Cullivan last week, right? Yeah, we, we heard about uh, Pakenham uh, being brought home in a barrel of brandy. That The, the sailors did exactly the same thing there. Um, they tapped the brandy, and by the time Pakenham got home, he was in a bit of a state. Um, Mike, there's also... I, I believe it's authentic. I can't say I've read every single source. There's also the, the tale of how Lord Horatio Nelson's body after Trafalgar on the way home was preserved in a barrel of brandy as well. And uh, Purse's rum in the Navy was still called for a while in Nelson's blood on occasion because of the idea that, you know, anything anything that's a spirit is potentially a preservative as well. So I, I'm, I'm, I can't say that I would be a big fan of... <laughs> of drinking anything, um, however much I crave the alcohol um, that had been run off from a jar preserving a dead animal or still worse, a dead officer. 
No, no, I'm with you. I am with you. Well, it's it's interesting, you know, Jack so worried that whoever drank this is going to die. And, and Stephen replies, he will not. That is what is so vexing. The bloody man, the more than hun, the Scottish rappery, he will not die. It was the best double refined spirits of wine. So, you know, I just always love to see Stephen in a swivet, as, as we say here in the South. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jack invites Stephen to come and have breakfast with him. And O'Brien writes, uh, in, in Jack's words here, a pint of coffee and a well-broiled chop between you and the ass will appease. And you know, Brian has kind of a dot, dot, dot. In the gaiety of heart, Jack was very near a witticism. He felt it floating there, almost within reach, but somehow it escaped and he can find himself to laughing as cheerfully as Stephen's vexation would, would with decency allow. So, I, you know, this is one of my favorite things about Jack, how he gets so much personal joy at his own attempts at witticism. My mom always found joy in the silliest little things. So it brightens my memory of her and of Jack. Oh, bless. Excellent. Excellent. And uh, for those of you who were with us reading Master and Commander at the beginning uh, of your circumnavigation, I hope you're not disappointed to know that this is going to be a feature of the, the dialogue that we enjoy with Jack for many, many books to come. Right. Yeah. So Jack, meanwhile, tells Stephen that the Frenchman, this, the, the Gloire, had run clean away from them and wanders, like everyone else in the crew except Stephen, whether Dylan had also managed to pick up the settee which had nominally surrendered after that ball through the uh, the foresail there. Um, he suspected if they had the chance to run, they would never have respected their, their original surrender. They wouldn't know this for quite some time because the wind has died, and Jack doesn't want to put men out in the sweeps to pull the ship in this really hot, humid day, given how hard they've worked, how well they've worked, how well they've fought so far. Although he still thinks that the guns and the gunnery, the broadsides, need to be faster. So he decides to wait until the dog watch, which gets us to about 6 p.m. As the day goes on and he's falling asleep, Jack's got this kind of slightly strange, detached perspective. And O'Brien kind of brings us into Jack's internal monologue here, his reflection. He thinks that the morning's battle must somehow belong to another age, another life, or indeed, had it not been for a lingering smell of powder in the cushion under his head, to another kind of experience, to a tale he had read. He's been catnapping, and when he wakes, he knows that the Sophie's been running easily before the wind for some time. And he goes up on deck, and they can see that Dylan had indeed picked up the settee. And another little note of admiration by Jack towards Dylan. He thinks this must have been tough, trying to organize the prize whilst pinning the settee before she could get away. And in once again, in, in modern naval parlance, um, Jack gives him a bravo Zulu. He tells Dylan, well done, as he comes aboard and asks if the settee had tried to run. Dylan tells him that she had indeed tried to run. They'd captured her with the help of a Captain Lahir of the French Royal Artillery, whom he introduces to Jack. And there's, there's another little bit of Aubrey um, witticism and fun here. Um, Jack's reply to Monsieur Lahir, Captain Lahir, is domestique, monsieur which is an attempt to say your servant, which would be the polite um, English form to an officer. Um, actually, Jack had picked the wrong word. Um, the domestique means your maid or your butler rather than votre serviteur, which is what the, the more formal, polite version of your servant would be. And since the snow was a prize full of French loyalists, um, this guy, Captain Lahir, had taken control of the French prize crew prisoners and the ship's Italian sailors while Dylan and his boarding crew went across in the boats to take the settee. And Mike, really interesting little landmark here. The, the brush with the Gloire was our first encounter with a French warship. And we are, what is it, seven chapters in to the book here. The first French character that we actually meet face to face, you know, besides the French captain pointing his musket at Jack, the first French character that we hear dialogue with isn't an enemy, isn't a scheming Bonapartist or a villain. Um, He's an easygoing royalist with uh, with an easygoing attitude and some comic delivery. That's, that's a good little tone setter for us. We're not going down the cliched road of French military officers all being baddies. We've found a French military officer, first of all, who's kind of on our side. Yeah, and, and it kind of 
you know, it puts a face on this, you know, going from personal animosity to the, you know, anonymity of war that O'Brien had mentioned a little while ago. Now we're actually getting personal again, but the personal, as you say, is good. Yeah. It's good here, which is kind of neat. I do like that tone setter. Dylan reports that, you know, while while he did capture the one settee, they hadn't been fast enough to get the other settee and the tartan who were also in that convoy, who had sailed away and, and gotten under the guns of the battery at Almorera. And Jack is pleased to know that since the snow, the Neapolitan snow with the French royalists had been taken eight days ago, even though she's an ally, she still counts as a prize for the Sophie, along with the settee, which is a, a straight up prize. Jack reports that he had no dead or seriously wounded and that the privateer had run away from them much too fast for the privateer to do any damage to Jack, but also for Jack to do any damage to the privateer. And Brian tells us Jack had a notion that some fleeting reserve passed across James Dillon's face or perhaps showed in his voice. But in the hurry of things to be done, prizes to survey, prisoners to be dealt with, he could not tell why it affected him so unpleasantly until some two or three hours later when the impression was reinforced and at least half defined. So, Jack is sitting there looking at a map of, of kind of where they are in the world, the surrounding area, and they're having a discussion about going after the other prizes. And Jack tells Dylan, Stephen, and Marshall, the master, uh, you know, sitting there uh, over this map, that Stephen has learned from some of the prisoners that that other settee they're going after has a cargo of quicksilver, that is liquid mercury, hidden in flour sacks, and therefore must be handled with great care. And when Jack says, you know, they'll have to handle it with great care, Dylan gives this, oh, of course, right? And and it's it's interesting because, you know, I, I'm, I'm listening to Patrick Tall, who I love, and, and you know, we're going to come around, you know, Rob Broughton, one of our listeners has, has talked about, you know, we need to get into the audiobook, so we, we'll have to come back to that and remember, yeah. we definitely need to do that. But Tall kind of misses this, but we hear that Jack looks at Dylan very sharply, wondering if Dylan thinks that Jack is shy or lacks courage, if, you know, if Dylan supposes that Jack had stopped chasing the privateer in order not to get hurt, and so he could come running back to grab another prize. And, and you can kind of understand, you know, Dylan has gone through a lot here, worked really hard to, to take these prizes, and Jack comes running back. They had that slow run back, so all their damage is basically repaired. They've got no wounded. And, and you know, maybe you can kind of see where Dylan might have this thought. Mm. But, wow, it's quite the situation, this interpersonal thing kind of playing out here between the two of them. Yeah. And I feel bad for Jack because he's been working so hard to kind of praise up Dylan and sincerely admires him. And in sort of inadvertently trailing to Dylan the fact that this, this has been a great action. No casualties and plenty prizes and more coming. Right. He's absolutely said exactly the wrong thing to Dylan. Right. Once again, a little bit of tone deafness from our boy Jack. So, Mike, that they're going ahead with this plan. They've got this scheme for going into the, the, the bay, into the harbour at Almoreira, and Jack is reviewing the map. And he quizzes Stephen because Stephen says that he'd been there some years ago, so he's actually got some interesting recollections. I'll use a well-chosen word here. He has some intelligence yes. to share <laughs> from his visit there a few years ago. And the plan is that as the Sophie fires at the battery from within the bay, Jack will take the snow, the settee, and the boats around the point to get to the other side. They'll take crews ashore in the boats, fire a rocket to tell the Sophie to turn her fire away from the battery so that then his crews can go ahead and take the battery's tower. And then they'll cut out the settee, that they've, the one that they didn't take. And Jack then gives the assignments for who's going to do what. And Dylan is shocked when Jack announces that Dylan will command the ship while Jack commands the cutting out party. And my, uh, I think this is a deliberate move. And I, I, for the intention that he has, I think it's a smart move by Jack. As he goes back through the timing, Jack assumes it's going to take 10 minutes 
to run from the cove to the battery tower. And here, Mike, O'Brien turns on a dime. We've been right there with this awkward tension and slightly competitive uh, vibe between Jack and Dylan and Stephen completely sticks a pin in that. 10 minutes from the cove to the battery tower. Allow 20, if you please, said Stephen. You portly men of a sanguine complexion often die suddenly from unconsidered exertion in the heat, apoplexy, congestion. I wish, I wish you would not say things like that, doctor, said Jack in a low tone. They all looked at Stephen with some reproach, and Jack added, Besides, I'm not portly. And we get the lovely button on this little comic uh, end to the scene as Mr. Marshall interjects, the captain has an uncommon genteel figure. <laughs> so we're left hanging. As Is Jack going to be able to carry Dylan's goodwill along with him in this action that's coming? All we know is we get this final comic reminder of the, uh, the, the attraction that Jack holds for Mr. Marshall and Stephen's little sarcastic put down there as well. Right, so, right. Mike, um, I think I'm going to go and uh, grab something to eat to to supplement my uncommon genteel figure. How about you? <laughs> that sounds like a brilliant idea, Ian. Uh, we'll be back in just a moment. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole. Welcome back. We hope that you're feeling well nourished after the break. Uh, Mike, before we get on with the rest of this chapter, we had a couple of extra thoughts about Cheslin and the Sin Eater. And maybe there's an interesting connection, not only to the idea of people who are who are pariahs and outcasts, but also to the identity of what a Sin Eater is for and how they, how they work in the community. Yeah, it, it, it's so funny because we were talking about this last week um, it occurred to me kind of right as we were finishing that a sin eater sounds a lot like a scapegoat. You know, in, in the Old Testament, um, you know, the, the people would sort of take a goat and, and sort of ritually put their sins on the goat. And then one of two things would happen to the goat. But one of them was they would sort of drive the goat out into the wilderness sort of, you know, with their sins upon it. And then they'd be kind of spitting at it, and throwing stones. And I thought, well, that sounds just like Cheslin's function as as a sin eater now interestingly you know when i went back and looked up that reference in the bible i realized which i had forgotten i i, I remembered that they drove them out in the wilderness like that i had forgotten that there were two scapegoats and one scapegoat is that one we've just mentioned driven out into the wilderness where their sins you know going along with them just like the sin eater but there was a second scapegoat and that scapegoat would be sacrificed kind of, you know, on an altar to God so that you had these two goats. And I really started wondering, we've got this thing going on with Dylan and with Jack kind of where the scapegoat comes in a little bit is, you know, we use the scapegoat even today. It's talking about how we're kind of, you know, making somebody you know, well, let's just apply it here. Dylan is kind of making Jack a little bit his own scapegoat. When when Dylan's feeling a little bit, you know, guilty or questionable about his honor, he questions Jack's honor. When Dylan seems to have a little bit of his own, perhaps fears that he's not admitting to himself, you know, he's questioning Jack's courage or shyness. So, I, I you know, I I really am kind of fascinated yeah. Whether O'Brien means to stick this idea in our minds here, we we, it's it's funny. I mean, just moments ago in the musical scene, we had you know Jack inviting Dylan to come listen to music with he and Stephen, and and Dylan says, "Oh, you know me, music. It's like pearls before swine." Well, yeah. you know that's just a you know an everyday reference we make, also biblical from Matthew from Jesus' teachings. The yeah. fascinating thing is the two verses right before that are about not judging other people. You know, judge not lest ye be judged, that kind of thing here. So here's Dylan kind of, again, this judging, this cleanliness, this uncleanliness, this scapegoats, all of these things. It's almost, it's subtle, 
But by gosh, you know, it's O'Brien. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'd love for us to keep this in mind, these two scapegoats, as we see how this stuff plays out, especially, you know, it seems ever more important as, you know, now we've had, you know, Stephen suggesting that Jack could kill himself running along the beach here. <laughs> and yeah. Jack trying to prove his honor, if you will, and his not a lack of shyness for Dylan here. So, you know, fascinating. Oh, Mike, I think that's a, that's a really fascinating link to make. Thank you so much. The, especially because it heightens, the more you think about this and the more you dig into it, the more it heightens our sort of uncertainty and discomfort about Dylan and what what his character is there for and what he's going to go through in this story. Huh. So the plan is set. For all, Dylan may or may not harbor some doubts about Jack's conduct. Jack's going to go inshore and do the do the dangerous work now of leading the cutting out. The weather is perfect. And looking into the harbour, Jack sees this seti, the uncaptured one, directly across the harbour from the battery. And he reflects, and by this is where we get the real deal about what Jack's intentions are here. He reflects, I may not be perfect, but by God, I am not shy. And if we cannot bring her out, then by God, I shall burn her where she lies. And she, he's really determined to prove to Dylan, of course, that A, he has physical courage and B, that he's not all about the prize and that he's very happy also to do the king's work by by burning and incapacitating. So, uh, Mike, we're anticipating this cutting out raid. This is the first one of many cutting out raids in the Jack Aubrey story. Lots of them follow a similar pattern. We have a promontory or a headland. We have a lighthouse. Um, we have a party going ashore in boats heavily loaded with raiding parties. We have the mothership anchored on springs as a kind of uh, gunnery support ship. We have surprise usually at night. Um, all of this, as well as being Jack's modus operandi, was also a pretty typical modus operandi for Thomas Cochrane. Um, we said before that there are a couple of different uh, French vessels called the Gloire. There was a French corvette called the Gloire that was part of a cutting out expedition that uh, Cochrane led in 1806 when he was commanding HMS Palace. So th this is going to be a favorite little schema for O'Brien to come back to again and again. And it's a great vehicle for Jack and his improvisation and his tactical know-how. Jack is now on the Neapolitan snow and he's watching the Sophie sail away. And he's realizing that, you know, she's going to take some fire from this battery because Stephen certainly doesn't know what size guns are, the battery. They're not sure exactly how far she can fire. And and he wishes so desperately, while he wants to be on the snow and leading the cutting out party, he wants to be on the Sophie at the, exactly the same time um, and starts worrying about all the things that could go wrong and, and how that might impact the Sophie. And he has this moment of realization about how deeply he feels about the ship, about how intimately he knows her uh, and, and how much he loves her. And this is, you know, again, it's another one of these things that just grabs my heart about Jack, the way he falls in love with his ships here. Um, yeah. Well, in the dark, uh, they're in the dark. Jack and the boats, you know, kind of take off from the snow and they're headed in to shore. And we've got Pullings commanding one of the boats with 14 men and the Marines. Jack's commanding the cutter. And he's got his coxswain uh, Bondin and Mr. Ricketts. That is the midshipman Ricketts, not his dad, the purser. Yeah. Um, Captain Lahir is also with them. And they're, they're heading to shore and they hear the battery opening up. And, and Jack's like, oh, my gosh, that sounds like a really big gun, maybe a 36 pounder again nervous about the Sophie also kind of nervous and patting himself down. You know, do I have my pistols? Do I have my sword? And, and wondering, you know, where, where's the Sophie's broadside? Why isn't the Sophie firing back here? And, and the cutter that Jack is leading is sailing ahead of Pulling's launch. Um, there's also the snows boat commanded by Moet, the jolly boat being led by the bosun and his crew and the settees launch with Marshall and a crew here. So they got a lot of guys heading on shore here. And when they finally reach the shore, they hear the Sophie start firing back. So I think there's that. <gasps> thank goodness here. Yeah. Uh, and, and fascinatingly there, you know, it's dark and they've tied ropes so that each man has a knot you know, along the road. So these crews can kind of be led along together in the darkness uh, and follow each other. And they're, you know, they're running down the beach, heading for this 
Tower, this long stretch that that Stephen had kind of warned them about on the beach here. Yeah, and interestingly, this is clearly this kind of amphibious nighttime maneuvering is clearly something that Jack is okay with. We haven't heard yet whether this is something that the crew's got experience with, but he seems to be doing a great job carrying them along, and maybe it helps that they've already got to this point of competency and courage and teamwork in their gunnery that means actually they can also handle kind of tricky nighttime maneuvers like running through the dark roped up to each other they get around the point they can see the tower and sophie is firing sophie also fired at the jetty to discourage anyone from trying to warp the settee ashore the run into the tower (laughs) 10 minutes 20 minutes i don't think we actually ever actually find out was further than he expected anyhow (laughs) Uh, he doesn't succumb to apoplexy, but he does succumb to deep, soft sand. He almost stumbles, has a very difficult time turning away from the firing, but he runs on. His heart, says the text, almost choking in his mind. The ground was harder. They ran faster, coming closer to the battery. They're wondering whether they should fire the rocket, and they decide to get in even closer, almost getting hit by a shot from the Sophie glancing off the chapel rock. Finally, they're there. Bondon sets off the rocket. Jack rallies everybody, shouts, come on. They cover the remaining distance, throw up the grapnels and swarm up the ropes. And like this is like, you know, an amphibious raiding party from down the centuries. Um, Jack pulls out his sword and his pistol over the top and there's no one to fight. The remaining gunners have jumped and run after the first two who had went down. They start spiking the guns, literally pounding an iron spike into the uh, into the touch hole to disable them. And Captain Laire from the French Royalists um, is working at beating off the locks with a crowbar. He has an even better idea. Uh, better make leap. Make all leap in the air. And Jack, cottoning onto the idea that leap in the air means blow up, asks if Lightyear knows how to make them all leap in the air. And Lightyear replies, Eh, pardi. Now, eh, pardi, I have a feeling that it's a contraction of par Dieu, which means by God, or colloquially, you bet your ass. I've seen some odd translations. The the guide for the perplexed says, you don't say, but that doesn't really make sense to me as something that an enthusiastic demolitions guy would say at this point. So Captain Lightyear is set away to calculate the amount of gunpowder that he needs to demolish the battery with explosives. Jack tells Marshall to take the Marines to lay down the covering fire whilst Marshall and the men get the settee's head around while Jack and Lightyear stay back to blow up the fort. We join Jack back on the Sophie. So the, the action's now over. And, and you know, I love this. It's kind of, um, you know, it's typical O'Brien again. You know, like all this stuff. Here we are. We're going in. We're going to blow up the fort. We're going to take the ship. Oh, we're back on the ship. Uh, we learn now that a second powder magazine below the first had, in O'Brien's word, falsified Captain Lahir's calculations. So yeah, okay. instead of, you know, merely sort of blowing this thing up so it's not usable, uh, apparently, you know, the thing goes up like a half mile high. Jack has lost half of his long blonde hair. You know, his, his scalp and face on one side are completely seared and bruised along with his hair gone missing. And, and he's now shaved kind of the rest of it to not make it look so odd. And and Jack is sitting there asking Stephen's help writing his official letters. Jack, and, and I, I absolutely uh, I'm with him, hates to write official letters. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> oh my gosh, you know, I don't mind doing all the stuff, but now I got to write a report. Oh, no, no, no. And we learned too that, you know, Jack was not alone in his injuries. Captain Lahir also, you know, bruised and singed as well. They both got caught in the blowback on this fort here. So they've now taken this Quicksilver settee, the settee that has this Quicksilver aboard. They've blown up the fort with its 424 pounder. So in fact, as we suspected, you know, Jack was a little bit, oh God, they sound so big thinking about they're going to injure his Sophie. They weren't quite that big, but still plenty powerful. Um, And Jack had actually burned three tartans in addition to the ships that he took that they had hauled up and chained to the key. Um, In his letter, Jack takes time to praise Lieutenant Dillon, you know, for all his prior actions with the snow and the first settee and for his continuous fire on the mole and the battery, which made the cutting out expedition successful. Now, he says it's insidious to name others by name since they all did so well, but he does want to call out the contributions of Monsieur Lahir. 
And Stephen suggests that, you know, while this letter is much better than the prior three, that perhaps Jack wants to use invidious, meaning, you know, unfairly discriminating, instead of insidious, meaning treacherous or crafty. So Stephen, Ooh. always good. And, 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 you know, Jack, of course, says, yes, yes, yes. Of course, you're right. You're right. I trust we, we write that with a V, right? <laughs> Good stuff here. Well, as one of my older teachers used to say, English is easy when you know the words. <laughs> That's right. And by the way, it, uh, I love that little sort of dark reference to um, insidious, treacherous, and crafty. Sets us a little bit on edge there. And the prize with the Quicksilver cargo. I don't think it's an accident that it's, that it's Quicksilver. This very li literally mercurial, this very volatile, potentially toxic element. Um we should also keep an eye on the idea that prizes might not necessarily all be good news. Uh, read on as far as post captain to find out how Jack's prize taking might in fact turn out to have some toxicity for his fortunes in the future. Mm. But we're, we're, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. They continue with their cruise. They stay well over the horizon during the day while Spanish military ships cruise up and down looking for them and come in at night to go after ports and merchantmen at dawn. They're good because Jack's equipped and prepared the ship well, and they're lucky. Jack's working them hard still at the great guns. Dylan's working them hard on the sails and keeping the ship gleaming, despite the fact that Dylan takes an even greater delight still in, as we hear, taking the whole frail, beautiful edifice into immediate contact with the king's enemies who might wrench it to pieces, shatter, burn, or sink it. The crew has done well. They notice now that Dylan's showing more attention and respect to the captain since the cutting out. Dylan is starting to speak highly of Jack and about this action in the gun room. And Mike, Mike, I, I'm really excited at this point. My heart's raising here because maybe these two guys, Jack and Dylan, are going to find each other as colleagues and maybe even find each other as friends. Absolutely. Jack has calculated at this point that they have taken, sunk, or burnt 27 times their own weight, basically doing just what the Admiral had asked and making money for the Admiral whilst doing it. Things are going great. You're thinking, ah, oh, well, you know, we're on a roll now. But that water that they had left behind in Mahan catches up with them. And, and now it looks like they're going to have to cut the cruise short and, and head back to Mahan early. Um, and Jack's so bummed. Yeah, there's not an 18th century word. The engram is not going to have it. <laughs> He's so upset that he, you know, he really wanted the culmination to get to the shipping lanes off Barcelona, the busiest ones in the Mediterranean. And that was going to be like the big thing for the crew, the big thing for Jack, that after all these prizes, they're going to get even more here. And Stephen says, well, you know, if you don't want to go back to get water, there's this remote spring uh, not far away. Uh, there's no town there. There's no defenses. They can just kind of go right up and grab it. You know, Jack says, well, why didn't you tell me this before, Stephen? <laughs> and I love Stephen. You didn't ask, right? So, yeah. <laughs> uh, And Stephen says, by the way, as long as you're going there to get water, you know, do you mind if I spend some time on shore? And uh, Jack kind of, you know, grins and says, oh, I, I suspect you want to stay overnight. <laughs> you know, Jack thinking that uh, Stephen's going to visit a woman has a hard time hiding his smile and, and, and agrees. Yeah, we'll do that. And they, you know, then Jack says, well, you know, so I'm going to send in a cutter for you in the morning. But, um, you know, what are you going to do? Like if we miss each other? And Stephen says, well, no problem. You know, I'll just keep showing up every morning. And you just get in when you can, and I'll, I'll get there when I can. And we'll just keep looking for each other in, until we go off. So Stephen goes to check on his loblolly boy, you know, the recovered sin eater, Cheslin, and, and says that he's a little concerned because he's been attempting in a fumbling way to poison his shipmates. He's uh -huh. been putting this this Creta Alba, which is essentially chalk, calcium carbonate, you know, an antacid and a diarrhea treatment into their, you know, when he mixes up their medicines because he thought that that, you know, had some toxic effect. There's a plant with a slightly similar name, perhaps. I, you know, I'm not quite sure how he got that. But Stephen's like, you know, I just want to make sure before I go, <laughs> he's not going to do them any harm here. 
Uh, uh, by the way, Stephen's noble humanitarian intentions to save Cheslin from the fate that awaiting him at the hands of the rest of his messmates completely dished here because actually Cheslin's busy trying to poison them anyway. Right, right. Here we here we still have this kind of ongoing O'Brien theme here about what people do to each other here. Yeah. And the theme of this uh, closer and closer connection between Jack and Dylan continues as well. After taking Stephen ashore, um, Dylan and Stephen talk about the dinner that they had eaten with Jack and his new French cook um, imported or pressed from the Santa Lucia. And Stephen notes that Dylan seemed in high spirits at the dinner. And Dylan says, yeah, I, I pushed aside naval etiquette to make a greater attempt to be civil with the captain. And a really great admission here from Dylan. I have not been altogether fair to himself, you know, far from it. And it was handsome to invite me. Stephen notes to, to Dylan here that Jack does indeed love a prize, but prize taking is not his primary concern. Dylan agrees and says, yeah, but not everybody would know that. He's just pointing out that Jack, with some of his rather unselfconscious behavior, might not be doing himself the best turn possible. The captain, he says, does himself a disservice. The crew, says Dylan, needs to know this because he thinks it's a small step from prize money to plunder to drunkenness and to mutiny. And what Dylan calls the steady officers, the bosun, the gunner, marshal, and Dylan himself as well, are going to have to hold the men in check. Mutinies happen, he says, where discipline is too lax or too severe. And Mike, once again, I've got this little glimmer of hope that these two guys are going to connect with each other. But. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, Dylan's being a little critical of Jack here, but he's saying, you know, don't worry, you know, we're kind of, you know, we're going to make up for that. We're going to, you know, we're going to do that. And he's, you know, he's kind of, he now seems to be saying, yeah, Jack's not exactly the guy I thought he was. He's yeah. he's a good man, right? Well, you know, Stephen thinks Dylan may be mistaken. And he says, you know, that, that when Dylan says that the men don't know the captain, he points out how, you know, even the most unlearned people in a village can kind of correctly suss out the character of other people. He said, you know, you never know a village opinion to be wrong. He said, but it fascinates him, Stephen says, that how learned men seem to lose this penetration, this ability to suss out other people's character, just like they lose the ability to remember poetry. Um, and then Stephen has an interesting comment. He, he's surprised that Dylan seems to be saying that their discipline is relaxed on the Sophie. Mm. And it, it's interesting that they're comparing d discipline in different parts of the Navy because Dylan has got a perspective about discipline. Um, and Stephen's interested in this because he's not quite sure where to set his kind of his barometer in terms of the severity and the harshness of the discipline. Dylan says what's commonly known as discipline is indeed quite strict on the Sophie. But he, Dylan, meant something else. He's talking about the discipline that Jack passes on. Um, a commander, he says, is obeyed by his officers because he is himself obeying. The thing is not in its essence personal, and so on down. If he does not obey, the chain weakens. I might, th th this is quite interesting here. Even though Dylan does seem to be warming up to Jack, trying to be more civil, he's saying that it's visible, perhaps, that Jack doesn't respect the chain of command, that he's not in good terms with Commander Hart. He's got a bit of an insubordinate independent streak. And maybe, therefore, Dylan is saying that Jack weakens his his authority over the, the ranks below him. And therefore, maybe, Dylan is saying that Jack's officers are propping up Jack, despite the fact that Jack's got you know, position looks weakened through his insubordination. Could, could be. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, it's really fascinating here. I, I, I got kind of the same feel that, you know, that Dylan is, is again, I'm, I was just feeling so good about them kind of growing closer together. And now it's like, oh, we're starting to veer off a little bit again. Yeah. 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 Heart sinks a little bit at this idea that Dylan's still got some reservations about Jack. Right. And the reservations, I think, get deeper um, as we realize what actually happened after the party in Mahon. Remember, we were all worried about people becoming quarrelsome. Dylan passes his current grave mood off as thinking about a soldier that he had killed in a duel back in Mahon. The soldier was angry and poor, says Dylan, and said, sea officers only join the Navy for prize money. And Dylan had said, you're mistaken. The soldier said, you're lying. And Dylan had challenged this guy to a duel 
and killed the in you know as as described the poor stupid clumsy fellow easily and this is pretty dark stuff again we're back into this very destructive core at the heart of dylan he's a rich educated guy he's a skilled duelist he kills this poor angry stupid soldier over word heard during a drinking night on shore and we we talked about this last time or two times ago i think whatever dylan counts as honor is clearly motivating him but it makes him hard to like because it doesn't seem to run through in quite the way that you'd expect yeah, I, I I agree. He's feeling a little grave about it now, but it sounds like he just had no compunction whatsoever yeah. about doing this guy who I suspect was in his cups in, realizing that it would you know just be a simple thing to do and it would have been even simpler just to walk away. But no, no, you know this guy said he's lying, so you know Dylan feels his honor commands it. Well, you know one of the one of the men reports that the water casts are full. And so Dylan says goodbye, like, you know, you know just, yeah, and Stephen, yeah. Stephen heads off kind of into the darkness. Um, Stephen's climbing up and O'Brien tells us that his feet know these paths. It doesn't matter that he can't see. And, and that at the very top of the promontory, it gets to the top, there's just a little bit light left in the sky. And he sits quietly by a stone on which is engraved, non fui, non sum, non curo. And it, then O'Brien says the rabbits come back as Stephen's sitting there quietly nibbling the thyme nearby. You know, T-H-Y-M-E, but we'll come back to that time. Yeah, it says, and O'Brien writes, he, meaning Stephen, meant to sit there until dawn and to establish a continuity in his mind, if that could be done. The friend, though existent, was merely a pretext. That is this friend that that Stephen was going ashore supposedly to see. Silence, darkness, and these countless familiar scents and the warmth of the land had become in their way as necessary to him as air. So this, boy, to me, Ian, this was just a big, whoa. You know, so here we had Stephen supposedly going ashore, Jack's assuming maybe to see a woman, yeah, you know, I'm not really sure why. And now he's sitting by what's likely to be a gravestone with rabbits nibbling on time, perhaps mm. T-I-M-E, if uh, if we're to pick up that time, the the herb there, mm. you know. And what's what's O'Brien's connotation for us here? Well, the translation on this stone is it's Latin for I was not, I was. I am not, I do not care, which has been called the Epicurean epitaph. It's it's a quote that many of Epicurus's followers placed on their gravestones. You know, he believed in no afterlife and and thought, you know, in his words, death is nothing to us. For that which is dissolved is without sensation, and that which lacks sensation is nothing to us. And and Stephen seems to be kind of a, a you know like almost like a true Epicurean here, in that he's come on land to order his thoughts. Um, Epicurus believed, uh, unlike some of the ways we sort of interpret this now, as is kind of you know more towards debauchery, not at all. Epicurus believed that the greatest good was to seek a modest, sustainable pleasure in the form of a state of kind of tranquility and freedom from fear. And, and where possible, an absence of bodily pain. Um, and usually that came through in his teachings, a knowledge of the workings of the world and limiting our desires. So, you know, here's Stephen like, OK, I can be happy if I just get back into nature, the sights, mm. the smells, the sounds of a night, you know, listening to these rabbits nibbling at time here. You know, and, and a curious thing, if we go back and l- look at some of these writings, Epicurus said his followers generally withdrew from politics because it could lead to frustrations uh, no uh, and, and ambitions which conflict with the pursuit for peace of mind and virtue. So, boy, great advice for us all here. So I'm wondering, you know, is, is Stephen just stepping away from everything at sea for a minute? Is he taking some time to get back into nature? Is he kind of stepping away from these brewing conflicts but inside Dylan, between Dylan and Jack, some of what's going on here? I, I don't know. Any thoughts? 
Well, I mean, the the first thing that occurred to me was that we're we're getting Stephen painted even more clearly here as having a very introverted personality. Yeah. Um, when the guns are firing, he likes to be below. Um, when uh, things are crowding in on him, he likes to check out and find his own space and reflect. Um, and I'm and I'm kind of with him partly there. I think it's really ambiguous as well what other purpose he might have when he goes ashore. It's not too much of a spoiler to say that in a chapter or two, we're going to learn that Stephen's going to learn some interesting things while he's ashore uh, on the coast of Spain here. So why does he need a clear mind? What's the goal that he can achieve that will be helped by him, him feeling tranquil and clear headed? Hmm. Yeah. It's, it's certainly, this is certainly a very auspicious visit for Stephen, given how we know his interest and his personal crusade against Napoleon are going to build up. And uh, in this chapter, Mike, there's an episode coming up as well that Stephen needs to be not around for. Right, right. And and it's it's kind of fascinating. So, you know, I, I think you're right in so many ways when you stick a pin in. It sounds like Stephen really meant to be assured just overnight in this solitude. But as we see as things turn out, it goes differently. Ah, so Jack, you know, wants to run inshore very early the next morning. He's uneasy with Stephen being ashore. Um, And Jack says, O'Brien writes, there are times when I feel he should not be allowed out alone. And then again, there are times when I feel he could command a fleet almost. So Mm -hmm. I, I love that. You know, Jack has this incredible admiration but realizes that in some you know, incredible admiration for Stephen, realizes though that in some areas Stephen can be a little bit wanting here. So, you know, Jack is ashore in the dark, waiting for the light for when Stephen's going to come down. And Jack is thinking about how much better he's getting along with Dylan as he's sitting there. How, you know, he, he is noticing that the master seems a little sullen sometimes. Um, and, and he, you know, kind of continues this flow of consciousness, how much he respects Dylan for his fox hunting back home. But then there's this little curious line where he's thinking about Dylan and fox hunting and O'Brien writes, yet it was strange. He should mind so little about the noise his dogs make for the cry of a tuneful pack. You know, here's Jack kind of thinking, oh gosh, I love the noise that a pack makes while they're hunting. And I, I'm not sure is this you know, just a little line here that, uh, you know, Jack's into a reverie. Is it that there's still some differences between him and Dylan or is it O'Brien, you know, the cry of a tuneful pack? Uh Uh-oh, there's a hunt in chase. There's a, you know, there's a fox in view here because all of a sudden the Sophie signals, you know, cannon goes off and she's signaling in every way possible, strange sails in sight. So Jack, writes a little message to Stephen. He takes Bondin's knife, writes it in a stone, carves it, and and thinks to himself, you know, I want to be a little secret here because part of what's going on in Jack's mind, Stephen's ashore in Spain. If he gets captured, he, he'll be hung as a, you know, as a spy. So he writes in Latin, I will return, and leaves his the time and his initials. Uh, interestingly, the, the first one of the two uh, to leave covert messages for the other is Jack. <laughs> right? right, I love that. And we we get one of these little O'Brien moments of a fleeting paragraph or two of really grave jeopardy. These mm. strange cells are in sight. We don't know who they are. If these turn out to be hostile, if these turn out to be French or Spanish, then Sophie could just be trapped in the bay between these two large men of war, and that would be the end. Like there's there's no two ways about it. They're all thinking, well, if we're going to have a dust up, then this could be it. As I say, a couple of paragraphs in, we learn that these are ships of the Royal Navy. Jack is called aboard the San Fiorenzo by her captain, Sir Harry Neal. Uh, Sir Harry Neal was a, a, a real captain in the Royal Navy at the time, by the way, of course. Um, Jack, in the, fictitional, <laughs> in the fictitious world here, had been a junior midshipman under then First Lieutenant Neal and had served under Neal later on when Neal was a captain. We learn that Neal liked promptness cleanliness and perfection of dress and jack is going aboard uh, unshaved with his hair going in all directions what's left of it and much of his face still covered in stephen's bluish grease and we had dylan a couple of paragraphs ago raising this warning point about how maybe jack's command authority is diluted by the poor relationship he has with those who are senior i mean so far he's been fine with admiral keith 
but he has a hard time getting along with Hart. And he seems to be having a hard time getting along with his superior, Harry Neal, here. Um, it, it, it's not just, I think, that Jack is headstrong and insubordinate. Uh, he seems to encounter people that he doesn't get along with and doesn't suffer them particularly gladly. And I was wondering, Mike, whether O'Brien himself in his service career um, with one of the secret spying agencies in World War II had maybe himself had problems with rivals who were nominally his seniors and clashed with them, but maybe still being able to respect and get along with the, the higher up commanders. O'Brien seems to find it really easy to me uh, to write about petty, domineering, arrogant, over-promoted people. Uh, not that those have always been in terribly short supply. Right. <laughs> Too true. Right. The Peter Principle in action. Yeah. Neil admonishes Aubrey for taking his time getting on board. Um, and and Jack, you know, we here is is kind of a bit overwhelmed. He's a little bit overwhelmed by the size of this large frigate compared to his Sophie. Um, and he's really overwhelmed from this change of his having total authority on the Sovi to being totally subservient here in front of Neil. Yeah. Um, now, walking into the cabin, Neil says Jack's appearance hasn't changed much. And I'm, I'm thinking, what? You know, we just had O'Brien tell us what Jack looks like now, which is, you know, completely disheveled. And I'm, I'm wondering, has he just not paying any attention to Jack whatsoever because he's already rehearsed in his mind. Yeah, this is what I'm going to tell him and I don't care anything about Aubrey. Or is this a jab to say, you know, this is kind of what I expect of you. You're always a mess. But in any event, you know, he's he's just, you know, he he is that kind of guy that we would hate to be working under. Yeah, um, yeah. So, you know, Neil tells Jack that they are overburdened with prisoners and they're about to discharge 50 of them into the Sophie. And, and Jack says he's so sorry that, that the Sophie is absolutely crowded with prisoners. And he really is genuinely sorry that he can't oblige him. And Neil just thunders about this, you know, can't oblige me. You know, he's the senior captain and Jack will oblige him by following his order. Uh, he says, look, you've been sending all these men off with all these prizes. You can just little, put these guys in their cots. You know, I don't care. But, you know. Uh, you take these prisoners and then I have new orders for you, you know, you know, because mm -hmm. Jack's like, what about my cruise? You're not doing on the cruise. You're doing what I tell you to do. <sighs> and and my, it, we've had such a slow, slow buildup of expectations of positive spirit and success involving Jack and James Dillon. And this is the point at which this all starts to shift a little bit. Yeah. Uh, after Jack takes aboard the prisoners, he learns that they're going to have to join their search for an American ship, the John B. Christopher, suspected of carrying, drum roll, two United Irishmen rebels, uh, a Roman, that is to say a Catholic priest called Mangan, and another fellow called Patrick Roche. They'll have French names and passports. They might well be speaking French, according to the descriptions that are handed out. And Jack comes back and tells the Sophie's officers, none of them are happy. Some of the men are worried about Stephen alone in the woods and with, with, with typical um, Siemens paranoia, there, there might be owls like right. Stephen's going <laughs> to gonna come to grief at the hands of owls. Uh, but they're all pretty unhappy that their cruise has been curtailed. The three ships spread out. They're sailing parallel along the coast. They're covering 60 miles of ocean looking for the ship. These are long days. They stop three merchantmen who turn out to be neutrals. But one has information about having seen an American ship. They're shorthanded. They've got so many good men away in prizes. They're having to work very hard aboard the Sophie to keep up with the larger frigates. And what's also tough is that Marshall and Dylan have to stand watch and watch. And that means, Mike, that each one is alternating watches with the other, and they're both not really getting any rest here. Yeah, yeah. This is like the ultimate swing shift, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And Jack, with it, again, this newfound empathy for Dylan is really sorry. <laughs> that he has to be so savage to the crew. He's seeing the uh, lengths to which Dylan's having to go to to kind of keep this crew in shape. They have to keep up with the other two ships. They're short of midshipmen. And this sets Jack thinking that maybe he'll ask Dylan to nominate a youngster, perhaps Dylan's cousin or nephew or godson. This would be a really great compliment and normally is a sign that the captain and the lieutenant like each other. And Jack is thinking that maybe his coxswain or a sailor like Pullings would make an excellent oldster midshipman. And Jack worries that if the Spaniards find Stephen, 
as you said, Mike, they'll shoot him as a spy. So there's a lot going on in Jack's mind here as he's uh, joining this enforced cruise looking for the American ship. So Jack's been up since well before dawn, and he, and he lays down to sleep. And right before he falls asleep, he has two darts of intuition. One is that all is well with Stephen, and the other is that all is not well with Dylan. And he, and he thinks to himself, well, you know, maybe Dylan really was upset about losing this cruise. Or or maybe, you know, maybe like Jack, he's, he has been, he's worried about Stephen. Um, but we know what Dylan is really worried about, you know, he's got these, you know, these fellow co-conspirators, these United Irishmen that he's, you know, now part of the search for. Well, Jack sleeps well, but uh, a few hours later, he wakes when he hears these two low, urgent, quarreling voices. And then he realizes it's Marshall and Dylan. And he thinks to himself, why are they both on deck at the same time? This is not the watch change when they would be crossing each other. And he also realized that the Sophie has changed sails and is kind of moving differently now. So this, he can't go back to sleep. He heads up on deck in his nightgown. And Dylan kind of catches him and tells Jack that this is all his responsibility. He's overruled the master who now has the watch. So it's not Dylan's watch. Dylan's not even supposed to be there. He's ordered the helm put about to chase a ship that Dylan says he saw on the starboard bow. He's also reduced sales since they'll soon raise the coast of Mallorca. And Jack realizes, you know, says to himself in his own mind, that this is an extraordinary breach of discipline. But he figures there's no need to say anything because he knows that Dylan knows this. And Jack sees that there's this incredibly strong tension between Marshall and Dylan. Um, Jack can't see any sign of another ship. He asks the, the lookout. Nope, he hasn't seen any sign of a ship. And he asks Dylan if he's quite persuaded. And Dylan replies saying, fully persuaded, sir, quite happy. And Jack thinks happy is a very strange word to use in this situation here. But he thinks Dylan must be convinced to have done all this. So he lets it stand. He carries on. And in fact, later in dawn, a sail is sighted. Oh, and my, this is a really, really great moment, a really great turning point in the story. Uh, first of all, for the horrible, horrible irony that Dylan, having put almost his entire professional career and his honor and his discipline in jeopardy uh, to force the master to change course, that act itself has brought them closer to the ship that Dylan has been trying to avoid. Ah, oy vey, as you might say. And Mike, uh, uh, looking at the way O'Brien is now writing the arc for James Dylan, I, I, yeah. James Dillon, I'm afraid, one way or another, uh, Patrick O'Brien has got it in for him. <laughs> right. This almost sounds like one of the classic Greek tales. This is like Achilles being held up by his mom you know, over the river here. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and the, w- w- with this really almost delicious irony is intensified by the fact that Jack thinks, oh, Dylan did such a great job. Dylan was exactly right. He had great eyes. He he made the right call. And just as Dylan's heart is presumably sinking inside him, Jack is thinking, oh, well, whatever was going on between these two, Dylan's made the right call. Um, the quarry, this American ship, was way off the original course. Um, he's delighted that they're going to be able to get this over with quickly and get back to their cruise. He congratulates Dylan. He has a gun fired to stop the American ship which was still nursing a wounded topmast. And looking through the telescope, Jack tells Dylan he'll send Dylan over, since he speaks the best French without Stephen being aboard. Turning to give Dylan the papers, these descriptions of Mangan and Roche, Jack has this horrible idea that maybe Dylan is drunk. And he calls for Mr. Marshall to take over, and Dylan suddenly recovers himself, but he's still looking um, pale and sweaty and staring, and now he's very flushed, and clearly he's very, very deranged by this whole thing. Not drunk, but just upset. Dylan calls out to get the boarding crew ready, takes the sheets of paper from Jack. The Sophie keeps her guns trained on the American, and Jack orders the men not to respond to the taunts that are coming from the American ship. Jack continues to worry about Stephen and he's from Jack's point of view we just see Dylan pull across and finally Dylan comes up 
speaks again to the American officers and drops into the cutter with no prisoners. And Mike, again, we're on tenterhooks here thinking, what happened with Dylan? What's going to happen aboard this ship? We want, we want to see it. We want to be there. But no. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, we, we didn't get to see it. We didn't get to follow Dylan onto this ship. Like you said, we don't know what happens. And then O'Brien gives us a little bit of backstory here. He tells us that Dylan had had a sense of fatality ever since the Sophie was assigned to join in this search. You know, he hadn't known what he would do if he found these prisoners. Um, and he still didn't know, even as he was going up the American side. Um, but he did know, he was convinced that he was going to find Father Mangan. Um, and and O'Brien writes, although he had done everything possible short of downright mutiny or sinking the Sophie to avoid it, although he had altered course and shortened sail, blackmailing the master to accomplish it, he had known that he would find him. But what he had not known, what he had never foreseen, was that the priest should threaten to denounce him, to denounce Dylan, if he did not turn a blind eye. You know, uh, O'Brien tells us that, you know, when Dylan first spots Father Mangan, he doesn't like him, but that he also knows instantly that he is not going to, as O'Brien says, play the constable. He is not going to arrest these rebels and take them back to the ship. He's just decided right then, all right, I'm not doing this. But then he's threatened. And and he knows that it doesn't matter. But Orion writes that immediately the squalor of the situation became unbearable. So Dylan's just kind of like, you know, I I knew what I was going to do. But now this guy's threatened me to do what I was going to do anyways. And now it looks like I'm responding to this guy's threat. So he's he's just not quite sure how to handle this. So he pretends to examine every man's passport as he's thinking through this. And he knew, as O'Brien writes, there was no way out, that whatever course he took would be dishonorable. But he had never imagined that dishonor could be so painful. He was a proud man. Father Mangan's satisfied leer wounded him beyond anything he had yet experienced. And with the pain of the wound, there came a cloud of intolerable doubts. Boy, this is, you know, we were talking an episode or two ago about the stories we tell ourselves. And Dylan is in full throttle now with the stories he's telling himself. And I now, sadly, you know, now my heart is going out to Dylan going, no, 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 don't do this. And we get this this continued, really uh, strong, uh, ironic juxtapos- juxtaposition of Jack the ebullient, everything's going to be okay, right. and Dylan, who is just heartsick. Uh, Dylan reports to Jack that there had been no such passengers aboard. Ah, oh, so much the better, said Jack, cheerfully raising his hat to the American captain and waving it. West and a half south, Mr. Marshall, and how's those guns, if you please? The exquisite fragrance of coffee drifted up from the after hatchway. Dylan, come and breakfast with me, he said, taking him familiarly by the arm. You are still looking most ghastly pale. And Mike, this this is the key moment. You must excuse me, sir, whispered James, disengaging himself with a look of utter hatred. I am a little out of order. End of chapter seven. Man, man. I'll tell you, I, I, I immediately this brought to mind a little scene from from one of my favorite books and, and a decent film, although I thought the book was better, The Art of Racing in the Rain. And it's this idea that don't you just hate it when life is a burning bag on your front porch that turns out to be filled with shit when you step on it <laughs> to put out the flames here. You know, and, and I, I think this is brought to mind not only by the situation in which Dylan finds himself, but earlier we mentioned the ship, the Caca Fuego, which literally means shit fire, right? So we'll come back to that later. But, you know, this Dylan, you know, some of this Caca is of Dylan's own making. And, yeah. and, you know, I, I'm kind of alluded to this moment ago that, you know, you asked last time, you know, would I want to have a beer with James Dillon? And now part of me says, absolutely a beer, uh, you know, straight <laughs> uh, vodka, something that, you know, I want to sit down with this guy and talk to him before this goes any further here. 
Um, but then there's another part of me that, you know, reads about this look of utter hatred, you know, as he turns away from Jack. And I think, you know, God, utter hatred toward Jack. This has just happened to him. He's got himself wrapped up on this. Now he hates Jack. I don't know. Maybe he hates life, hates the world. I don't know. And I kind of wonder, maybe it's too late. I mean, what's going to happen next? You know, we've got Dylan saying earlier, you know, only the steady officers stand between Jack and this slippery slope of the crew getting wildly out of hand, you know, that, that the ass drunkenness was only a minor infraction. Uh, now, in these steady officers, Dylan and the master are completely at odds. Dylan and Jack completely at odds. Um, and, and I wonder now what's going on with Marshall as well, um, yeah. you know. We know Marshall and the Purser have had their moments over Jack before. Um, the Purser, not a fan. I, I, I don't know. This is this is worrying me. All it right, really let me. Is. I'm spinning out of control like Dylan. I better give up, turn it over here. Well, I mean, we've got all these relationships set up with these little conflicts, these major conflicts. Jack is still right now thinking of Dylan as a friend, a fellow officer who's so like him that Jack wants to honor him with the naming of a midshipman. He gets this really contrary reaction from Dylan, even as he's been trying to take care of him. And how's Jack going to respond to that? Is he going to continue, you know, hail fellow well met? There's Stephen, the peacemaker, who's not been around. I mean, I, I'm quite relieved that Stephen wasn't around to be put in the position with Father Mangan and Rosh. But still, what, what's happening with him? Why is, how, how's his head-clearing trip ashore going? Um, the ship's overrun with prisoners. Lots of them are dangerous privateersmen. He's doing this under... Uh, under sufferance from the senior captain, Harry Neal. The officers are distracted. The, the crew are still probably upset that they've lost their crews. This doesn't look good. And we've got this, the, the Cacafuego still out there, but maybe that's not the biggest threat to our heroes. I don't know, Mike. What do you say next time to just a little bit more Patrick O'Brien? I should like that of all things. <laughs> counts as honor is clearly motivating him but it makes him hard to like because it doesn't seem to run through in quite the way that you'd expect no, no. <laughs> well there's there's mosey's comment on dylan's honor that's <laughs> <laughs>